Hi, this is Chapter 3, Control Volume Analysis, Part 4. In the previous video, we talked at great length about Reynolds Transport Theorem, which allows us to convert a system analysis to a control volume analysis. And what we're going to do now is use Reynolds Transport Theorem to derive the conservation of mass equation for a control volume. And I should point out that in fluid mechanics, the conservation of mass equation is usually referred to as the continuity equation. Uh, so conservation of mass and continuity equation mean the same thing. And then we're going to do a very simple uh, numerical example. In the previous video, we spent a substantial amount of time deriving Reynolds transport theorem uh, really with a focus on one-dimensional flows. And so I've rewritten here Reynolds transport theorem for a one-dimensional flow for this arbitrary extensive property B. And remember, an extensive property is just the property that depends upon the, the mass or extent of the system. So what we have here is that the rate of change of B within the system so this is the fixed amount of mass that's passing through the control volume, equals the rate of change of this uh, quantity B within the control volume, plus the rate at which B flows out, minus the rate at which B flows in. And remember, this property uh, beta here is uh, the intensive property, the corresponding intensive property, and it's defined as dB dm. So, for example, if B is uh, momentum MV, then the intensive property would be V. In this case, we're considering conservation of mass. So we're thinking about mass flowing in and out of the control volume. So in this case, we're going to use, we're going to set B equal to M. So now if we take the derivative, dB dM, we just get that beta equals 1. And so we can set beta equals to 1 in each of those terms. Now the general principle of conservation of mass says that the mass of a system, and by definition a system is a fixed quantity of mass, it can't change. Mass can neither be destroyed uh, nor created, neglecting relativistic effects. Uh, and so for general engineering purposes, the mass of the system is constant. So we get that uh, the rate of change of the mass of the system with time has to be zero. So we can set that the term on the left-hand side to zero. Now in the next slide, what we do is we rewrite this with that beta set equal to one and the left-hand side set equal to zero. So here's the resulting equation for conservation of mass for a one-dimensional flow. We have the left side equal to zero, we have the storage term, and then we've set beta equal to one, so we just have the mass flow out minus the mass flow in. And we noted in a previous video that the mass flow rate is just the density times the cross-sectional area times the average velocity in a, a duct or a pipe. And so I've made the substitution here I've made the substitution for rho AV for the mass flow rates. And what we have down below then is on the left side, we have uh, the rate of accumulation. I've done a little rearranging. The rate of accumulation of mass within the control volume equals the rate of mass flow into the control volume minus the rate of mass flow out of the control volume. Now, if you've done uh, in thermodynamics, you will probably already have seen this equation, but as I pointed out the other day, uh, the biomedical students don't get thermodynamics. Now, I should point out that we could have come to this without using Reynolds transport theorem. It's really very simple mass accounting in this case. And one way to sort of remember it is to just think about replacing uh, the mass flow rate with money. You know, if you think about your bank account, it's just simple. It's just like the accounting in your bank account. Uh, you know, if you deposit $100 a week and you take out $25 a week and you do that week, on, week in, week out, your bank balance is going to go up at a steady rate of 
$75 a week. So you can see it's, it's a very intuitive, uh, simple concept, uh, continuity. Now, if the one-dimensional flow is steady, in, in steady flows, that means that you know nothing is changing in time. So time derivatives go to zero, and so the rate of the rate of change of the mass within the control volume. There's going to be no storage if it's steady. The rate of change of the mass within the control volume equals zero. In that case, you can set the, the storage term to zero, and you just get that the the rate of mass flow out equals the rate of mass flow in. And of course, you could have any number of inlets and outlets from your control volume, so you've got to sum over the inlets and the outlets. And so that's for steady one-dimensional flow. So rho in, A in, V in has got to equal, summed over all the inlets, has got to equal rho out, A out, V out, summed over all the outlets. And we're going to extend, use this equation extensively in the rest of the course. And so, for example, for this uh, control volume that I've shown over on the right-hand side, we've got inlets at 1 and 2 and an outlet here at 3. So in that case, you just say this is the mass, this is the mass flow rate at 1 plus the mass flow rate at 2 has got to equal the mass flow rate at 3. If the flow is incompressible, so that would be the general form that you'd use for a gas. But if it was a if it was a liquid and the, the density is a constant, doesn't depend on pressure, then if that's the case, then you can you can cancel the densities here. But only only if it's a incompressible fluid, only if it's a liquid. And in that case, you just end up with that the volume flow rates are conserved. So the volume flow rate at one plus the volume flow rate at two must add up to the volume flow rate at three. So that's very simple, but that's only for in incompressible fluids. Now, so far, I've been considering sort of ideal one-dimensional flows, uh, but I say here often the velocity across the cross-sectional area is not uniform. But in reality, it's it's never uniform because you have the no-slip condition at the boundary, so the velocity at the surface of the pipe or duct is always going to be zero. And I've drawn a pipe here, sketched a pipe down here, where we have a, a laminar flow and we have a parabolic velocity profile. And in this case, if we want to apply this flow uh, to one-dimensional equations, we have to put in the average velocity here. And so we calculate the average velocity by integrating the mass flow rate uh, and setting the mass flow rate for the one-dimensional flow equal to the mass flow rate for the non-uniform non flow. So looking at this equation over on the left-hand side, rho a v bar, that's going to be the mass flow rate for the one-dimensional approximation. That's got to be equal to the integral of rho v dA, which is the uh, local, integrate the local mass flow rate across the area, the cross-sectional area of the pipe. And so then rearranging, you just get the V bar equals the integral of rho V dA integrated across the pipe divided by rho and then A is the total cross-sectional area of the pipe. If the pipe is round, you've seen in previous examples, we use a little annular area for dA, which is 2 pi r dr. There's a nice solved example in your textbook. Check out example 3.4 in the chapter 3 where they solve the average velocity. It's fairly straightforward, I think. As an aside, I thought I'd say a few words about the different velocity profiles you get in laminar and turbulent flows and pipes. This is really jumping ahead, but it's worth mentioning it now and then you'll hear it again when we when we talk about the details of pipe flow in chapter 6. So if you consider two uh, fully developed flows, and by fully developed I mean these are flows in a pipe that are well away uh, from the entrance of the pipe, so the, the velocity profiles become fully established within the pipe. Uh, if you consider two fully developed flows with the same average velocity, v bar, if you have a low Reynolds number, then you get laminar flow and I mentioned that in a previous video, I think it was one of the introductory videos from chapter one. 
It turns out that for a uh, pipe, if your Reynolds number is less than about 2300, and that comes from the famous Reynolds experiment that you're going to uh, reproduce in the lab in one of the experiments. If, the, if that Reynolds number is less than 2300, you get really smooth flow, no eddies, no lateral mixing across the pipe, and you end up with a velocity profile across the radius of the pipe that's a parabola. And indeed, later on in the course, I think uh, in the next chapter, we're going to derive the equation for uh, laminar flow in a pipe. And in that case, I'll tell you the result. What you get is that the, uh, that the maximum velocity here, this, this maximum here, is two times, two times the, uh, the average value. That's for laminar flow, where you get a parabolic velocity profile. But when you increase the Reynolds number and you get into a really fully turbulent flow, so we have strong mixing, that corresponds to a Reynolds number around uh, 10,000 or greater. Then you get a lot of eddies in the pipe. Random mixing, lots of mixing from the center of the pipe towards the wall. And that transport, extra transport of momentum by the mixing produces a much more uniform velocity profile. And it, as you can see here, we don't have the that huge difference anymore between the average and the uh, maximum velocity in the pipe. So turbulent flow in a pipe is actually a better approximation of a one-dimensional flow, much more uniform distribution. That's probably more information than you need right now, but uh, it's worth mentioning it since we were talking about average velocities, and we'll come back to this issue when we uh, uh, talk about Chapter 6. I'd like to end the video with a short uh, simple example. What I'm considering here is water that is being pumped steadily through a long fire hose with a nozzle at the end. And the mean jet velocity uh, at the nozzle exit is 35 meters per second. And I've written uh, sort of the conditions here, 35 meters per second. And the exit of the nozzle, this diameter here, that diameter there, is 45 millimeters. And what we want to calculate is the volume flow rate that has to be generated by the pump in cubic meters per second. So we're after the, the volume flow rate here that's being generated by the pump. I've drawn a control volume, the dashed red line, and we're going to consider the inlet to be section one and the nozzle outlet is section two. And we're going to you know, use one-dimensional approximations using the average velocities at those sections. This is a very simple but important example. So I've written the continuity equation here. We have the, the, rate, the rate of storage of mass within the control volume equals the rate at which mass flows out minus the rate at which mass flows in. And we're told it's a steady uh, flow. So if it's steady flow, time derivatives here go to zero. So we can get rid of that term. We just have, as we discussed previously, that the mass flow rate at section one equals the mass flow rate at section two. So row one, A1, V1, the average velocity at section one, equals row two, A2, V2, the average velocity at section two. We can combine these two terms. Remember, AV is just the volume flow rate. So we can rewrite them at, in this form where row 1 times the volume flow rate at 1 equals row 2 times the volume flow rate at 2. Now in this case we're talking about liquid water. Liquid water is incompressible, it does, its density doesn't change with pressure, so uh, row 1 equals row 2 and we can cancel that term with that term. And so we just end up with that the volume flow rate in the hose is a constant. Q1 equals Q2, and in fact at any cross section we'd have the same flow rate. And since we have the area and, and velocity at section two, we're going to evaluate the, the flow rate at section two. And that's what we do next. So the area at section two is just pi d2 squared upon four. So pi times 0 0.045 meters squared divided by four. And we get here for the area uh, 1.59 times 10 to the minus 3 square meters. And then we just multiply that area by the mean velocity, the average velocity that we're told at section 2, which is 35 meters per second, to get the volume flow rate. Check out the units. 
you have area in meters squared times velocity in meters per second. So we end up with cubic meters per second, which is exactly what we want, the volume flow rate. So that's five, that's the answer there, 5.57 times 10 to the minus 2 cubic meters per second. Meters, cubic meters per second is a pretty large unit for, for volume. If you want to get more of a feel for what that means, you can convert it to liters per second. And I've used the fact that one liter is, uh, you know, a, a liter is a 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. That's the volume. So it's 0.1 of a meter times 0.1 of a meter times 0.1 of a meter or 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters. And you can see from that that the volume flow rate is 55.7 uh, liters per second, which is something more meaningful in terms of understanding what kind of flow rates we're talking about. And that completes this video.